Welcome to the Transformation Goddess Divine Feminine Spotlight. I'm your host, Shan Vanderleek, founder of TransformationGoddess.com and PodcastBath.com. The intention of the Divine Feminine Spotlight is to share transformational stories of women who have learned to walk in beauty with the strength, courage, and pleasure of claiming their feminine sovereignty. I know you'll enjoy listening to one of the most popular interviews I had the pleasure of hosting as part of the Goddess Talk Sessions global event. Light a candle, kick your feet up, and prepare to be inspired by a woman who walks in beauty and speaks her truth. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my friend, Linda Monk. Linda is a registered social worker and a certified professional life coach with a specialty in therapeutic journaling and life writing for self-care, personal growth, and creative expression. She's an international best-selling co-author, the creator of Life Source Writing, and producer of the Creative Wellness Guided Meditation CD. She is the director of both Creative Wellness and the International Association of Journal Writing. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Shan, for that beautiful introduction and for creating such a sacred circle for all of us to be in together. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so I'm so very grateful that you said yes. Well, saying yes is part of reclaiming our voice. We need to know our yeses and our noes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Before we came together today, I lit a candle and I always smudge my office and set a sacred space and pull a goddess card for each of the women that I'm interviewing. And today, Lakshmi came up for you, Bright Future. And her message is, stop worrying, everything is going to be fine. And I'm wondering how Lakshmi resonates with you right now. Well, I love that. Thank you so much. As we were talking a bit before we came on to the interview, and as you know, I shared with you that I'm stepping into uh, another yes with a taking over a new community, the International Association for Journal Writing. And I've been doing lots of meditating and journaling and just being with the opening of that yes and trusting and trying my best to really just hold a clear vision, a clear energetic path for that work to reawaken in a way that will serve the greater good for myself and those who will be part of that community. And it's so easy for worry to creep in the edges, yes. fears of how it will go and all the different technical pieces. And, and I keep just coming back to that ground of holding a vision for that bright future and allowing the worry to stay as small as it possibly can to keep that opening pure and clear and ready to receive and give, you know, through that portal of that community. <laughs> uh, Lakshmi is right here with you right now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and with you, with us. Ah, yes. Let's begin by having you share your journey of reclaiming your feminine voice and standing in your truth. Well, as I hear you say that, Shan, what comes to mind is how many times I've had to do that in my life, that it's not a single moment in time. And I was doing some journaling this morning, preparing for our conversation together and asking myself, when are times that I've found my voice? And what's it been like when maybe I haven't been listening to my inner voice? And I've realized that it takes a lot of courage and intention to really, truly be aligned with that inner voice and speak my truth. And speaking comes in so many different ways in my experience. It comes through how I live, the choices I make, the relationships I choose to participate in. It comes through motherhood and marriage and my business and it sounds easy enough, but actually I've learned it actually takes a lot of courage to do. And it's actually been the times that have probably been most painful or difficult when I've really felt like, okay, I have got to really listen. I have got to just tune out 
everything else and the voices of others, expectations, even priorities I've put in place and just close my eyes, sit still, come home within myself in the most self-loving way I can and really listen and ask, what do I need to do now? What is present in this situation that I need to pay attention to? And so it's often felt like, you know, the first step in reclaiming my voice and speaking my truth is to actually ask myself, what is that truth? Because, right. it, we, you know, we, we can't be aligned with something we're not deeply connected with. So that's part of the work, or it's been part of the work in my own experience is to to ask that question. And in your experience, in your upbringing, were you uh, given space to share your voice, your opinion, and, and have a voice in your family? That's a great question. You know, quite often, I would say yes, and also a strong mix of quieting it. Uh, I was a fairly energetic, talkative kid and I remember going on long family drives down the 401 in Ontario, southwestern Ontario where I grew up and my mom would offer to pay me, you know, 25 cents if I could sit quietly <laughs> from, you know, <laughs> one highway exit to the next. And being a mother now and I can appreciate the last right. one will go to get a few moments of silence with their children. But there was also there was also messaging around like when I would share my dreams out loud, I would get messages like, oh, don't get too big for your britches was one of them, I remember. And right. just they weren't intentional or mean spirited. They were more comments that I as I look back now, I can see how there were many moments where I in retrospect felt like I needed to be smaller than I wanted to be or that I really was mm -hmm. and I'm an adoptee and uh, I I know throughout my childhood and into my more early adulthood I carried this feeling that I really needed to get things right you know I needed to be good enough I needed my parents to not have any regrets that I was the random baby that became their daughter and so I really wanted to please them and make them proud. And I think in some piece of that, I didn't always claim my voice. I wanted, I was the peacekeeper. I liked other people to be happy. Uh, so when you live like that, or in my experience at least, it's not always living true. It's not always claiming my voice it's more adapting that voice to make it fit to make the bigger picture fine and I've learned over time that sometimes the cage has to be rattled yeah that to speak our truth we we may be met with um, things outside of ourselves that we have to bump up against that aren't aren't always easy but it's not easy to live quietly and I don't mean quietly as in you know with or without a voice but to any time we're being smaller than we're meant to be less authentic than we want to be we pay a price and that price might come in ill health uh, it may come in just perpetual frustration it may come with challenges that repeat themselves like there's there's a well there's some uh, repercussions when we claim our voice the, you know vibrations really out into that energetic space of our lives there's also consequences to not doing that mm -hmm. and any of us who have gone through times when we've we've done that you know have our own unique experiences of that but I have found that if I'm out of alignment if I'm not living aligned with my truth I find the wheels just come off. So many crises happen, things go wrong, um, you know, I'm put through sort of pressure test after pressure test, and it's like, okay, I get it. Like, something is out of alignment here, and I need to dig in and listen and figure out what that is, and then courageously take steps to make a change.
What comes up for you or came up for you uh, when I first reached out and said that I wanted to to talk about what it means to speak your truth or you know how you feel when you hear the phrase speak your truth? Honestly, the first thing that came up, Shan, was over the past uh, number of years, uh, our family has gone through a real uh, crisis that has caused us to reevaluate our lives, our circumstances, and there were many things that happened. It was a perfect storm that led to some financial crisis, and we we had two fires in properties that we owned. We uh, went through a CRA audit. There were there was the feeling of literally being squeezed like in closed walls, you know, that like breathtaking oppressive levels of stress that were part of this circumstance. I remember being in my bed one night and it was late at night and and I just lay flat on my back in my bed and I just asked, what do I need to do or not do right now to help me and my family get through this with grace and a positive outcome. And I just remember my whole body shaking and vibrating and tears came. And I opened my eyes and coming through the skylight in our bedroom was the ray of the the moon. Oh, beautiful. And I just, even now, like my body gets a chill as I remember that moment. And the words that I heard, there was something to the effect that the the word surrender came. And this sort of message that just because I could hold on, just because I could do this, you know, cope with this very high pressure, didn't mean that I should. And there was some sort of invitation that night that had me really just sort of stop inside of myself and say, what do I really want in this situation? What, what opportunity is there in this crisis right now that I need to pay attention to? Where do I need to, well, reclaim my voice and speak my truth? That began a whole shift of events. I started turning more strongly into practices that are important to me. I was doing them all along, but I came at them more more wholeheartedly, taking time out in nature quietly to listen, writing regularly in my journal so that answers could emerge and I could just get out of my own way, if you wish, to see what wanted to come through this pressure cooker. And Somewhere in this feeling of absolute terror and fear, because that's what the lived experience of this crisis was, like in my skin, in sure, my thoughts, sure. in my, and was also this like, like I felt like there was a thread connected to the top of my head and my feet, and it was just being pulled, 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 and asking me to stretch, 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 but in the stretching to get tall to get bigger, to get more assertive, to get clearer on what do I want in our financial lives, which is, you know, an energetic reflection of the whole of our lives, I believe. And we started, you know, we had properties for sale, we had, you know, all kinds of things going on in in the midst of this. And the the, the, the being able to speak my truth allowed me to really get connected with the energy of letting go. Like so often in life, there's such deep attachment to what we wanted, how we thought it would be, what we wanted it to look like, what all our efforts, our goals were leading towards. Right, without question, without question. And without maybe reevaluating mm-hmm. if it's truly what we want and need now in this moment, in this chapter of life. And even if the answer is still yes, if it all slipped away, whatever the all is, who, who, who are, who am I in that? 
And when I got really connected to the feeling of I am worthy because I exist, my worthiness, my okayness, my safeness and security in this life is not this accumulation of wealth. It is not this property or that. It is not whether we get through this or we don't in one form or the other. It, it is my ability to deeply and completely be present to that sense of okayness and worthiness just because. And to nurture that wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. To, you know, what does it mean to love ourselves when we feel like a failure? Right. What does it mean to love ourselves when all of the external messaging might be that things are going horribly wrong? Right, right. And it's like loving someone else. It's easy to do when candles are lit and romance is there and, you know, all the, all the perfect conditions. But what does it mean to love and live true in during the grit in the in the hard times because something in that is where our voice lives is where our power lives based based on your experience and and thank you for sharing that that story and i'm so glad that you can look at it now from the other side and see how far you've come and how much you grew in that process based on your experience How can our listeners discover and embody and begin to amplify their voices? There's a moment when our voice is no longer just about us. And and I think as women, we feel that. We know that who we are, how we love, impacts not only us, but it impacts the people we love, it impacts how we show up in everything that we do. Sometimes I think when we talk about our voice, some women can filter that through and feel like it's very indulgent, it's selfish, it's something that if only she had the time for. I think one of the ways that we find our voice is to allow ourselves to really come home to ourselves, to give ourselves permission to deeply and committedly love the woman that lives within us, to cherish her, comfort her, love her, forgive her. Our voice is a reflection of the relationship we're having with ourselves. And a lot of life is lived paying attention to the external. And it's not bad. You know, it's paying attention to caring for people we love and doing our important work in the world to uh, showing up here, there and everywhere. I think to really find our own voice, we must be willing with the same level of commitment show up to the relationship we are cultivating each and every breath with ourselves. And that sounds simple, but I think and I've experienced and witnessed that it's often the biggest work we do as women. I agree. Uh, there, there are many listeners today who couldn't really tell you what turns them on right now, (laughs) what lights them up, what their in this moment purpose might be because of the caretaking and because of time and because of external factors, because of upbringing, whatever the story is. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so through that discovery, and and I suspect that that part of the how here in the discovery would be journaling. Journaling is obviously one thing that I suggest and advocate for. I just want to go back to what you just said for a second, Shan, about that 
not knowing what turns them on. I recently shared an evening with one of my best friends, childhood friends since we've been eight, and we, we really don't get to be together very often. We live far apart. And we were out for dinner and spent a night at a hotel together. It was the night of her 48th birthday. And we were literally having this conversation. And she said through tears and you know deep vulnerability, I don't know what I want. I don't know that almost those very words, you know, she didn't use the words what turns them on, but what lights her up? Yeah. What what brings her? This dear friend has serious health problems, gives, 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 works seven days a week in a, in a family business, cares for two teenage daughters, her husband. She just gives until, you know, I want to say until she bleeds. It hurts so much sometimes. In the moment when I was with her, and I love her very deeply and could feel her pain, she said, I don't know how to do it, just like you just said. My instinct was to just say, like, to just stop. Is there a still moment? If we can be still, and journaling is one practice for getting still, to just get it out, write it down, express our thoughts and feelings, see what patterns are there, listen and, and be a witness to our own self-knowing and and the parts of ourselves we don't know. I'm really confused here. I'm stuck. I'm in pain. I am i don't know what to do next. That that page will hold that vulnerability and it helps us hold that vulnerability in ourselves. The process of doing that builds that muscle in us. It builds that capacity of listening within. And each time we show up to do that, we hear more and more and more that voice, you know, that inner voice, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger on the page and in our lives. Wherever the willingness is for some of those still moments, we get met somehow. You know, the universe wants to meet us. It wants to support us. It allows us to energetically tap into something larger than ourselves, like the circle, like the circles that flow all over the world where there is intention to do that kind of inner work. We're never alone when we do it. It might be a solitary act. But while I'm in my journal doing that work, there's someone else somewhere on the planet probably going to the page doing that work. While I sit and meditate, someone else somewhere is doing that. That we can remember we're part of something more than just ourselves and take some sort of comfort and solace in that. And then when we do, that opens the door for discovery and embodiment because the more curious we are, you know, I love that the first thing that came to your mind for your friend, for your dear friend, was to stop. Mm-hmm. Because in that stopping, even for 10 or 15 minutes, so much can come through that allows, you know, if she says no an extra time each day, or maybe <laughs> maybe for the first time ever in, in her day, and to be able to stand in that and say, I love my family, I love my job, I love my friends, I'm a generous woman, and now I'm going to give some of that back to me. Mm-hmm. And this is what mm-hmm. that looks like. I think so. that's a beautiful um, image. And I think sometimes what happens is that we might get courageous and stop, especially if it's a new thing we're doing. Because sometimes it's been go, 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 not for a few weeks or months, but years, a lifetime. And that it can be scary, those first few times of stopping, of listening. We can hear things that unnerve us. We might hear things like, you know, I don't love my job. I don't want this relationship. And the busyness sometimes is a noise storm to keep us from hearing the truth, yes. truth, yes, and and I and more often than not, when I've been, for example, in my journaling workshops, that it a lot of energy sometimes has been given to keeping it all up, to keeping it all going, 
And there's real fear in stopping. If I stop, something horrible will happen. If I stop, I will come into recognizing something I'm not ready to recognize. Stopping, while it sounds easy enough, if the pattern of our lives has been to keep going, pedal to the metal, stopping can be a pretty scary space to go. So I think it's so helpful to be able to go gently. Yes. And maybe it's just a few minutes a day. And then you notice, how does that make you feel? And it might not make you feel good at first. It's like anything we do new, you know, if we start running and it's new muscles we're using, we might feel stiff and sore and think, oh, I don't want to do this again. I felt better before I exercised. Right, 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 right. It's like the stillness might bring, you know, such discomfort and, and pain. And I know times when I've come more deeply into that in my life, the stillness, it often does come with some pain, it can come with tears. But it's on the other side of that is where those little breakthroughs are. The, yeah, There's, always, the, always. And so you know, there is that sort of breaking down or, or, or coming apart that is, is, is a, you know, sort of a necessary passage into the other side of it, which is that growth, which is that hopefully finding more of our own voice. You said when we express the truth of who we are in all that we do, the universe rises up to support our deepest self-expression as a gift we give ourselves and the world. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the inspiration for this quote. Whatever we were talking about in the moment (laughs) inspired that, that quote. As I hear you say those words back, somewhere having a belief, or it's more than a belief, it's become a deep knowing at this season in my life that I trust will grow even further in my own journey ahead, is that sense that when we reach out with what really is our truth, even if it's blurry and unclear, we will be met, you know, that that expression that, you know, all forces of nature will will help us make it so. And I think of times in my own life where things felt just impossible. But then that gift comes along. A woman knocked on our door one night. And it was a, uh, you know, rainy, wintry, West Coast Canadian night. And to make a long story short, she had heard that we have cottages, we have a, uh, an accommodation um, you know, that we offer here in our community. And she had left a note earlier that day saying her name, that she was living in her car, that she was down to her last $500 and wondered if she was living in her car with her aged dog and cat. She shows up at her door, we offer her a place for the night and invited her to come for coffee the next morning. And she comes for coffee, beautiful woman. What ends up transpiring is we were in real need at that time as well. We were in need of some help in our home, in our places, with our children, but we didn't have the financial resources to pay for it. She needed a place to stay. We could offer that. And over coffee, we made an arrangement to do this on trade. We had been putting out in the universe, you know, sort of having this need, but not knowing necessarily how it would be met. And literally, this homeless woman shows up on our doorstep. And in our experience during that time of crisis, we had many, many what we called miracle moments where angels appeared. Angels came in the form of people, of loans, of found money, of new opportunities, and that feeling that the universe, the something, will rise up and meet us with in ways we may never imagine. And we have to watch and listen and see the signs and be willing, willing to ask for what we need, willing to figure out what that is. And that often means shedding a lot of pride, a lot of what we thought we would be doing and how we might be doing it. And beautiful beautiful and and we went on to have a relationship with that woman her and her dog and cat spent christmas with our family (laughs) our children fell in love with her she was a very special person literally strangers can come to our door and change our lives 
What a great and, story. What a great story. And those stories are everywhere. Yeah. They're, they're, they come in many different forms and many different faces and many different crises. But I guess the motivation for those words I said is knowing that actually we're not alone. We're not in isolation. The universe rises up yeah. to help us manifest what it is we're deeply needing and wanting especially when we give voice to what we're deeply needing and wanting. Right on, right on. You know, it's like in a marriage or any relationship. Yes. You know, our needs can't be met if we don't say what they are. Right, we can't, we can't expect our partners to know, to read our minds. And even then, it, they may not be met. Right, but they the, might not. But, but the voicing of it is meeting ourselves. Yes. Oh, I and, love it. And that changes everything. It changes how we show up in our longings. It changes how we define what they are. Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is our voice is never just for ourselves. It offers something to others, too, and it's just for ourselves. Right on. There's a, there's, you know, there's a paradox there. Sure there is. Sure there is. You have brought us a very valuable gift to the table for all of our listeners, and it's called the Transformational Writing for Wellness Kit. Can you tell us about that? Sure. It's a, a kit that I put together. So often what I hear from women I work with is, I don't know where to start, or I've been writing for a long time, and I feel like I'm going in circles. And so I've created this kit to help open new doorways into yourself, into your writing, your journaling, if you wish to do that. So the kit has uh, 10 healing benefits of writing, how writing can help us heal and be whole. It offers over 40 journaling prompts, questions, and exercises to help people go to the page and write. And it also includes a Celebrate You mini journaling retreat that has a guided meditation and a journaling exercise so people can do their own self-guided uh, mini journaling retreat for self-care and growth and finding our voices. Mm, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. And to all of our listeners, you can gain access to the Transformational Writing for Wellness Kit on Linda's speaker page. There's a button right there that will transport you over to her site, and you'll be able to download everything that she's giving you today. Oh, Linda, it's been such a pleasure talking with you. I thank you so much for saying yes to the Goddess Talk sessions. Hmm. Well, there's, there's a book called The Power of no and there's a power of course in our yeses as well and uh, it was a privilege to be asked so to I remember once watching Tony Robbins late night on an infomercial many years ago and he was up on the stage and he said he started every day with this mantra of yes 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 and so that word yes and a positive affirmative out in the world our yes is part of our voice and, and so is our no. And if we use them with discernment, it leads to beautiful places just like this circle. So thank you, Shan. You are most welcome. Thanks for listening to Transformation Goddess and This Sacred Life. Please leave us some stars and a favorable review if you enjoyed this interview. And be sure to visit TransformationGoddess.com to get my free guided meditations for women who do too much.